Hi, I'm Brian Pellegrino, CEO and co-founder of Layer Zero Labs. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so actually, um, back when I was much younger at this point, I was a uh, professional poker player. So I played poker professionally for eight years. I played the highest stakes uh, you can play all over the world. I uh, was one of the best heads up no limit players in the world. And one thing that happened is in April 15th, 2011, online poker was banned in the United States. And so this went from one day me having a career to all of my money being frozen, all of the websites being frozen, and all of the payment processors now not functioning anymore. And so actually myself and everyone else in poker found Bitcoin in 2011. It was very much a solution to a, to a real problem. The problem was there was there was no longer any way for us to deposit to the poker sites, to us to play, to us to settle or do anything. And so Bitcoin became that medium. So almost all of us started, you know, almost, almost 14 plus years ago now in 2011 using the technology for that. So that was my first, you know, product uh, product market fit with, with crypto was was Bitcoin was a real use case to, to move money around. And then came 2013 and really was the ethos of crypto that grabbed me, um, you know, censorship resistant, permissionless, self-custody, all of these things. And then it wasn't until 2016, 2017, when Ethereum came out that really, so my background was computer science, that really now you had this, this programmable money and you had the ability to make smart contracts and everything that you could do with that just became so incredibly captivating that that from that moment on I, I, i've been fully immersed yeah so layer zero is you have, you have you know all of these networks and so we support 140 networks you have you know, all of these disparate networks none of them talk to each other if you have money on one you can't pay somebody on the other if you're an application you can only take users from one layer zero very simply solves this problem it makes it so you can move money anywhere you can your application can fit, uh, interact with users anywhere you can imagine if your credit card only worked locally in your own country when you're traveling abroad you know now you can't pay for anything you can't uh, uh, use any services uh, all of that would be like a total nightmare that's the world that we were living in before and so layers are now you know we have a, you know hundreds of billions of dollars assets flowing on top of us uh, have enabled a huge amount of use cases so that this constant um, constant driving of, of value and the ability to, to move assets and, and really just take users from anywhere, make more of a global payment system, right? Make this really a global financial system rather than these isolated pockets. Yeah, I think we took a very opinionated stance. Most other interoperability solutions were trying to sell you some vector of trust. They said, here is our validator set. Our validator set is very special you trust us and we'll tell you kind of the answer on the other side. And the problem is when you when you talk to some of the largest assets in the world, some of the largest financial institutions in the world, the banks, there's no way one of these large banks is gonna give right access to some third party validator set. And if that validator set goes rogue, now I can and write something bad to the bank and, and mint you know billions or hundreds of billions of dollars of assets and, and, and screw all of that up. So our stance was always layer zero is immutable. We cannot change it. Uh, it is built in such a way that is meant to be secure and resilient for the very long term. People can build on top of it, knowing exactly what you're getting. And then that middle layer of how you trust it. If you're a large institution, you can run that yourself, right? You secure your own assets. So if you're a large asset issuer, if you're a bank, a financial institution, you have the ability to set and configure that own security. You don't need to trust any other third party. And that itself, I think, has been our, our largest competitive advantage. So fast forward to today, we have 82% market share. Almost every major stable coin is built on top of layer zero. 100 billion plus dollars moving across the network, 150 million dollars, um, 150 million messages actually sent, individual messages. And so all of these things are just continuing to accelerate constantly. Lazer is doing, you know, seven, seven plus billion dollars a month in, in value transferred, and that is continuously growing. Yeah, I mean, stable coins just happen to be, uh, you know, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin's amazing. Uh, and then stable coins post Ethereum, post like smart contracts have, have really been the one thing that have found real product market fit. And so when you look at Tether, $166 billion company, it's one of the largest holders of, of treasuries in the entire world. Um, and then you have uh, continuously like this long list of stable coin providers which are very clear it solved a real problem. This can be hedging against inflation from, from other currencies. 
This can be the ability to just have global payment systems and be able to send money anywhere to participate in this broader uh, financial constructs of, of DeFi, everything that's there. Um, and so it, that's less of a layer zero thing. Just in crypto, stable coins have become kind of the uh, number one product market fit. And then what does layer zero do for them? Layer zero now allows these stable coins to move anywhere, right? Again, I go back to the analogy of imagine your credit card didn't work in any other country, right? You want you as a business, you don't care if your users on Solana or Ethereum or Arbitrum, none of that matters to you. You just want to be able to accept the payment, right? Layer zero makes all of this totally seamless in the back end. And so it makes it so uh, you can pay anywhere. Uh, you can now move this. You can move hundreds of millions of dollars of stable coins for, for very, very cheap fees. So it's fast, it's cheap, it's easy, uh, and it has really accelerated the growth of a lot of these stable coins. Why, why do groups like uh, like the Wyoming stablecoin, right? The Wyoming state stablecoin, uh, PayPal, uh, USDT with USDT zero, Athena, why do all of these groups, why have they chosen to build with layer zero? And it really all comes back to that, that same underlying concept of we have built the system that gives them the security that they want. They own the security in the middle. They structure that exactly or they want. We're on 140 networks. There's a huge network effect of assets who are built on top of layer zero and demand for those assets. And so all of these things become a, a, a really large flywheel, both for, for really like and a stable coin that's built on layer zero uh, is just is is better than a stable coin that isn't, right? It really has become that. Uh, if you build this on the OFT, if you build this on layer zero, then you're going to get more usage, more volume, there's more venues, more integration. So all of that matters. And then the other side is just security that you cannot get anywhere else. And so all of those things matter and all of those things made a huge difference in these conversations. And I think placed the trust of these institutions with us. Yeah, so gaming has always been, uh, it's funny, uh, the reason we got into building Layer Zero came from a game, and I'll, I'll tell that story after, but gaming has always been sort of centerpiece to, to Layer Zero, right? It's always been something we thought, uh, I'm, I'm a long lifetime gamer, uh, we, we get to work with some of the best games in the, in the space, right? Groups, you know, with, with like groups like Godzilla, Ubisoft, so all of these things we've, we've got to work extensively with. So I love being deeply uh, sort of engaged in that just because I have, I have such a passion there myself. But originally with Layer Zero, one of the very first things we did before we even started the idea, this was in Binance Smart Chain was just starting to get popular. We were thinking of how, how do you move between uh, this fast and cheap environment that you treat kind of ephemeral and Ethereum? How do you go back and forth? And so we actually created a toy game for ourselves. And this game was, was you know, played on on this on BSC and it was fast and you could do everything. And then you would roll the result and mint this NFT back in Ethereum. So the, the game itself was, was a very kind of silly game, but it, but, it, but it was quite fun for us at the time. And so you would open packs of gladiators and you would get 10 gladiators with different abilities and items and all of these things. And they would fight to the death. Uh, and if you won 10, 10 matches, uh, so 10, 1 and 10, 24, you would be freed from the arena and that would mint back to Ethereum. So it leveraged the high throughput environment, cheap environment to do all of these actions on this one chain and then mint the sort of permanence valuable NFT back to Ethereum at the time. And so that actually, in building that little toy game for ourselves, uh, which just allowed us to kind of explore the technology, we realized you couldn't trigger events sending that thing back to Ethereum. You couldn't trigger events without a central coordinator. And that led us down the path of ultimately developing kind of the generalizable solution for, for how, how, do you, how do you actually trigger events between chains? How do you, how do you build a system that does that? Yeah, no, no question. So I spent a, a huge amount of my life, actually, uh, the, the the part between poker and uh, and this space in, in AI, right? So uh, I built and sold machine learning models to the professional MLB teams. I, I co-published academic research with Noam Brown and Facebook AI research, right? I, it's an industry I know very well. Uh, absolutely, the systems that are being built right now and the scale of what is able to be processed can can meet the demand of all of those. And so whether you're, whether you're talking about AI, whether you're talking about financial institutions, right? We spend now time with every major central bank and financial institution in the world. Many of them are already uh, building and starting to run POCs on top of layer zero. All of these things are, are conversations where are actively had. And there's never the question of, can this actually meet the demand, right? Uh, 
Layer zero itself has, has no restrictions. It can be as, as fast uh, and as robust as the underlying chains themselves. There isn't any additional overhead that's being introduced on top of that. Um, and so we've, we've never seen a problem there. A absolutely, it can meet the scale. Yeah, long-term vision, for, for us, it was always, listen, build, build the rails that the future financial system can be built on top of that. And we're, we've already seen that. We've gone from, from three years ago, nothing being built on layer zero, to now if you take just the applications built on top of layer zero, the verified applications, uh, we would be the fifth largest layer one in the entire world. Um, so we have a really rich developer ecosystem. We've now grown to, to you know hundreds of billions of dollars being transferred on top of the protocol, and this is just accelerating rapidly. Uh, we're up to almost seven billion dollars a month of being transferred on the protocol and growing. Uh, so all of these things are are just incredibly promising to watch. And so long term, what you see, you, you see that you know ramping to to hundreds of billions of dollars per month. You see this ramping to the financial institutions, right? Every way that money gets transferred or money gets settled uh, is going to be settled on rails like this. And so that's one view. And then the other view is we built this incredible ecosystem of, of gas abstraction across these 140 networks and how gas gets paid and how it becomes seamless for the user. Layer zero is structurally set up to make it so every wallet, every ecosystem only has dollar denominated or only has some sort of stable coin denominated uh, currency and doesn't need to have gas, right? We have the ability to facilitate where no user thinks about gas ever on any chain. So what, what do you think about the, like, the long-term vision of that is not only that all value being transferred and all the messages that are flowing for, for all of sort of the financial system, but all gas being paid anywhere uh, being fully abstracted through the underlying layer and just just making that process seamless across every chain and the, you, you can now deliver a user experience where the user doesn't ever think about that. They're no longer thinking about the technology, the gas, what chain it is, anything. Again, the, the merchant, uh, the business, they, they want to accept a user from anywhere. The user doesn't want to care where their merchant is or where they're accepting it. It should be as, as seamless as using your credit card or going on the internet or doing anything. Uh, and our goal is to build towards that world and just make it more seamless and make it easier for the end developer to build those experiences.